uh, and this project is with Aaliyah, Kate, Michael, and Nikki, and at the table, the Disability Arts Feast. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Dayton. I use they, them pronouns, and I serve at the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. And for the sake of accessibility, I'm also going to audio describe myself, um, which entails just a brief description of your visual appearance for viewers who are blind. Um, and I'll start by saying I have short brown hair and a beard. I am a white young male wearing a blue and white striped polo shirt. And behind me is my closet door with some pictures on the wall. Hi, um, my name is Kate McCluskey. I use she, her pronouns and my service site is Film North. Um, I'm a young white female. I have shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing a red shirt and I have an orange background. Hello everyone. My name is Aaliyah Gatto. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a young white female wearing uh, glasses with short brown hair and a blue sleeveless blouse. And my service site is Project for Pride and Living. And hi everyone, my name's Nikki. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, my service site is St. Paul Public Library. And I'm a young, uh, mixed Asian and white female. I have long brown hair and I am wearing glasses. And today we are here to talk about At the Table, a disability art feast, which was a virtual arts festival centered around access and connection, which showcased local um, Minnesotan artists with disabilities. And the project was inspired by a noticeable lack of engagement within our sites with local communities with disabilities. Um, we were also interested in um, doing arts programming and uh, soon learned that um, the percentage of Minnesotans with disabilities is um, above 10%, uh, reaching 20% if not more than that as well. Um, so we figured that combining all those together, we could perhaps plan a virtual arts festival engaging with these communities. And our conversations actually started with uh, Leslie Orr from Dreamland Arts, who our CTEP cohort may remember from back in the fall. She gave a presentation or um, a performance on um, um, Helen Keller called Hand in Hand. Yes, so like Michael said, we began our research and outreach with the Dreamland Arts team, Leslie Orr and Zara Orr Mystery, who kind of kicked off everything for us. They had immediately dropped the names of local organizations within their circles and um, just other organizations for us to reach out to. So we connected with those folks and they connected us with more folks. And we quickly realized the immense abundance of programs and resources that already existed for the community we wanted to serve, which is sort of a positive takeaway that we'll get to later. Some of these organizations included VSA, Springboard for the Arts, Midwest Special Services, Fresh Eye Arts of Evo, and really too many to name here, we don't have enough time. As we met with these organizations, we seek to answer the questions of accommodation and also wanted to assess the needs and wants of the community members. We wanted to put on an authentic festival and we realized that the only way to do that um, would be to fully and clearly understand the community, their wants and needs, and to take our own preconceived notions out of the formulation uh, when planning the festival. And we eventually even got to speak with the artists who were going to participate themselves about their experiences and insights on virtual events during the pandemic, which was a moment where the events and purposes really started to solidify. And we pretty quickly found our community partner in the Minnesota Council on Disability or MCD. I think it was David Fenley, the ADA director there who was referred to us by Leslie Orr. And then David connected us with Linda Gramillion who was the operations and program director. And the two of them were so instrumental during the entire process from planning to researching to executing. They themselves were very enticed by the idea of a virtual festival to heighten the artists the voices of artists with disabilities 
and they sort of expanded the scope of the project, which was quite daunting for us at first, but they stuck with us, they advised us, um, and they offered us guidance every step of the way. They were in the know about the local artists and kind of the local artist scene, um, and they connected us with artists who they thought would be good to feature for our event. They also helped with promotion for the event with an ad and access press and um, a radio talk show and a, a few other things. And they also ended up contributing $2,000 from the MCD funds uh, for funding the stipends of the four featured artists, um, which was huge. And they also assisted us with accommodations by connecting us with the Minnesota Council on Deaf, Deaf, Blind and Hard of Hearing. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about planning an accessible arts festival. Um, one big obstacle we knew we were going to have to face was just funding. Um, we originally applied for a grant with the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, but unfortunately we were deemed ineligible, so our grant was unsuccessful. Um, but luckily, working through the MCD, um, we did receive a grant from the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing Commission, um, and they provided a CART, which is captioning and ASL interpretation for the entire festival, which was super, super helpful, especially because those resources can often be very, very expensive. Um, we also consulted with Chad Miller from the Minnesota Council on Disability on web accessibility and flyer accessibility. Um, we built a website for the festival, but we knew that that website itself had to be accessible along with the, fest um, the festival. So um, we, we worked um, for a while on just making sure everything was good with that website. Um, and then we also worked with the St. Paul Neighborhood Network and uh, they allowed us to host some of their events live at SPNN and also use the equipment to film workshops of the artists um, and kind of very, and, and also worked as a go between between us and the MCD. Yeah, and then just to show some of our different promotional materials, um, we have a website that is at the table arts.org. Um, we built this one on Wix for anyone who's curious, um, and they have actually an accessibility tool that can um, tell you everything that's like not accessible about your site and um, how to fix it, which is was super, super helpful for this. Um, in the upper right corner, you'll see a homepage to our GoFundMe. We ended up raising about $300, which we were very, very excited about because um, we just did not know how that was going to do. Uh, and then at the bottom of the page, you'll see screenshots from the digital July 2021 edition of Access Press, um, which included a festival ad and a call for artist submissions. And then Michael also did a radio, like a radio interview with KFI uh, Disability and Progress show. Um, so we just, we did a lot of different things to try and get people registered uh, for the festival and to get artist submissions. Yeah, so I'll just do a quick intro on the artists that we worked with on our festival. Um, starting from the left, we have Tabisa Rowan, who is a musician and participated in the event as our MC, um, introducing each of the day's events. Uh, next is Allison Bergblum Johnson, who is a visual artist, storyteller, and performance artist. Um, and then we have Gabriel Broderick, who goes by the stage name Freak. Um, who's also a musician and performer. Um, and lastly, our very own Pierre Young participated in our event. Um, Pierre is a multidisciplinary artist who does painting, photography, podcasting, and is an esports coach. Um, also wanted to do a quick uh, shout out to Fresh Eye Arts, um, formerly known as the Creative Arts Branch of Midwest Special Services. They submitted a lot of the pieces that were featured in our um, artist exhibition. Um, so, and more info about them is also on our website if you want to check them out. The festival itself uh, took place over three days, starting on Friday, July 16th, so only a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it began with a storytelling workshop by Allison Bergen Johnson, uh, which Kate was actually an assistant for. Um, and then it was followed by a live screening of um, the submissions that we had for our exhibition, which was a collection of submitted work by other local artists who weren't involved in the workshops or panels, but were still exhibited and showcased. And then Friday ended with a panel on um, the education system, 
uh, with Allison and Pierre. And then on Saturday, we started off the evening with a songwriting workshop uh, with Gabriel, who performed and also led audience members through the creation of a song, um, which the lyrics should be on our website as well as the title. It was a great goofy time. Um, and we wrote a successful song as well. And then after that, that workshop was followed by a panel with Gabriel and Tobiso on what it's like being artists, specifically musicians with disabilities in Minnesota. And then Sunday, our final day, uh, started with an afternoon nature drawing workshop with Pierre. And then after that workshop, we ended the festival with the screening of Sleeping Between Worlds, which was a feature length film presented by Fresh Eye Arts. Great, yeah, so um, we just wrapped up our festival a little under two weeks ago. Um, we all felt that our event was definitely a success. Um, we had art showcases featuring seven different artists and we had 14 registrations to the event. Um, that being said, thinking about taking takeaways that um, and how we can continue this work in the future. One, uh, I think really big learning moment for us was that fear of failure was kind of a barrier for us throughout our planning of the event and um, I think affected how we promoted and how much outreach we did. Um, but we also realized that we don't need to aim for perfection in order to create a project that is still impactful and that we can be um, proud of. Yeah, another big takeaway was just artists for everyone. Access is a practice um, that we can all do every day, um, such as when we started off doing audio descriptions of ourselves. Uh, and also disability communities are not monoliths. Um, it's very easy in our like language and even the language of this presentation to talk about them as kind of one big cohort, but it describes, you know, a lot of different people with very, very different identities. And the next takeaway is about the power of resource sharing amongst organizations, which we found creates a sense of community, which is important and very powerful. People who participate in the programming of all the organizations we spoke with are able to access that community because these great organizations work fluidly together and are passionate enough about what they do to create an excellent support system. And the last takeaway is that of the possibility for replication or continuation of this event, hopefully. Maybe in the future, there will be CTEP members who will wanna take it on, or maybe some of the featured artists, or maybe um, our community um, partner at the MCD might wanna continue it. The hope is that it would grow and become even better than what we could accomplish this year. And now we will take questions. This was a hugely ambitious project, wasn't it? But I think there, there's always like a couple of projects that like they can like try to get funding in like multiple ways. And like you had like your real like ups and downs with that. And like what an incredible learning experience, I think, for the future of like trying to make community change, like how hard it is to put something of the scale on. And like you found a way to make it happen. Like you should be incredibly proud of that. Um, all right, we had uh, Arian ask, do you, do you at all foresee making this an annual thing? Yeah, um, that's the hope. And it has been expressed by like David and Linda that they would like to continue this specific event. Like there are, one thing we realized when we were um, coming up and planning this is that there are a lot of things going on similar to our event, um, especially happening in July, which is Disability Pride Month, as well as um, the celebration of the anniversary of the American Disabilities Act. So, I mean, there are, there are a ton of events going on similar to ours, but yeah, the council was definitely interested in having this be like their own version or even one of the artists to be so, um, mentioned wanting to steal the idea for the work that he does with other organizations as well. 
So, mm -hmm. and uh, another thing is like it would, if it does become an annual event, like it would have to um, kind of start and be like a year long process too, mm -hmm. is one of the takeaways. Like we definitely had enough time to plan everything, but um, kind of for the scope of what we were hoping for, it takes a really long time. Yeah. I would foresee that both SPNN and Dreamline Arts would be really excited about trying to continue to collaborate with us too in the future. So I think you have a lot of people that would want to continue to make this happen. And um, I really hope that it does. <laughs>